Well, if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to open them to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 25, uh, verses 2 through 38 is where we're heading. Uh, we're going to break it up uh, throughout the message, but uh, we'll also have the words up here on the screen. Um, 1 Samuel's in the Old Testament, so if you're hanging out in books that go Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you need to hang a left, okay? Hang a left. It's in the Old Testament. Well, this is 1 Samuel chapter uh, 25, uh, beginning in verses 2, going through verse 4. Now, there was a man in Maon whose business was in Carmel, and the man was very rich, and he had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats. And it came about while he was shearing his sheep in Carmel. Now the man's name was Nabal, and his wife's name was Abigail. And the woman was intelligent and beautiful in appearance. But the man was harsh and evil in his dealings, and he was a Calebite. The David heard in the wilderness that Nabal was shearing his sheep. All right, so our text starts off with three people. One is a beauty, one is a beast, and one is a would-be king. Okay, one's a villain, one will prove to be a would-be hero, and the third has actually been placed in between the two. So the beast is a man named Nabal. What a name, Nabal. Now, he's wealthy. He's got capital, he's got commodities, he's got land, he's got livestock. We're not told how he acquired his wealth, but we do get the sense that it's his primary sense of identity, okay? Well, Pastor, how do you know that? Well, because he's introduced that way. In fact, we hear about all of his riches before we even hear about his name. And so Nabal's possessions kind of precede his personhood, if you will. His life is led and it's defined by his property and his possessions, okay? Okay. And we also know something about the beast in terms of personality, okay? He's characterized as being kind of crude, kind of rude, kind of mean. He's dishonest, he's ill-behaved, all right? And his name describes who he is as a person because in the Hebrew, the word Nabal actually means a fool, a fool, and Nabal, in our story, he not only exhibits the stupidity of a fool, but he's vicious, he's mean-spirited, he's, he's a person who lacks manners and the common sense the good Lord gave a doorknob. Um, I was trying to think of who we might compare him to today, and, and the only thing that came to mind was this guy's a cross between Al Bundy and Dwight Schrute from The Office, all right? This is not a good dude, all right? Now, to be called a fool in the Bible is no small thing. It's actually one of the most contemptuous terms that you could be called in the Bible. Psalm 14, verse 1 tells us, The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. So fools are people who have come to think of themselves as being independent of anybody and everybody. Totally self-sufficient. Uh, these are folks who claim to know it all, have it all figured out, and to be superior to everyone in every way. That's kind of a fitting description of Nabal. Now, we're also told something else about Nabal. We're told that Nabal, the beast, married way over his head. He did. You see, Nabal's wife is the beauty, all right? She's the beauty, and her name is Abigail. And Abigail's pretty much the opposite of her husband. She's beautiful inside and out. She's intelligent and clever. She possesses gifts of perspective, of discernment, and diplomacy, really. And in our text, Abigail speaks and acts for God. But I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Okay, uh, we're going to hear more about Abigail in a little bit, but I need to take you to the third person in our text, and that's our would-be king, David. David. And as David enters this scene, we find him actually at a pivotal point in his life. You see, uh, David, at this point in his life, he's on the move. He's living in caves. He's running for his life in the wilderness. Why? Because King Saul wants him dead. Okay, he's pursuing him with all speed and with no small amount of wrath. 
Now, one of the things that I believe David learned in this season of his life is the importance and the value of community, of having people around him. And, and so what he did was he began to draw together kind of a ragtag group of people, and, and the number soon swelled from 400 to 600 people, and that didn't even include the wives and the kids, all right? Now, I need to let you know, though, this group that David assembled around him, Pam, they're not the cream of the crop. They're not. Uh, Ted, it's more like the bad news bears. That's what we're talking about here, okay? 1 Samuel 22, verse 2, gives us kind of the makeup of the group. Uh, the text tells us that they were in debt, they were in distress, and they were discontented. That is not a good trinity of things to have. Um, this is a group who either couldn't or didn't want to make it in society. Yeah, these are the type of people, if I can put it this way, these are the type of people Garth Brooks was singing about when he sang, I've got friends in low places, <laughs> okay? That's these guys. But under David's leadership, they've actually kind of been turned into somewhat of a well-organized guerrilla warfare type of fighters. And, and they actually play an unofficial role of neighborhood watch, neighborhood watch group, okay? So at the time, you need to understand the wilderness, that's kind of a high crime district. You didn't really want to be in it very often. Uh, it was filled with bandits and outlaws, and uh, defenseless people were plundered, and travelers were taken advantage of, and, and in David's men, they protected shepherds from predatory raiders, okay? And, and among the many people that David and his, his people helped was actually Nabal. And so let's keep going in our text, okay? David heard in the wilderness that Nabal was shearing his sheep. So David sent 10 young men, and David said to the young men, go up to Carmel, visit Nabal, and greet him in my name, and thus you shall say, have a long life. Peace be to you, and peace be to your house, and peace be to all that you have. Now I have heard that you have shearers. Now your shepherds have been with us, and we have not insulted them, nor have they missed anything all the days they were in Carmel. Ask your young men, and they will tell you. Therefore, let my young men find favor in your eyes, for we have come on a festive day. Please give whatever you find at hand to your servants and to your son David. Okay, so the text tells us it's time for sheep shearing, all right? Uh, this is obviously kind of the equivalent of harvest time for farmers. This, this is time to cash in on your investments, so to speak. It's a time for hospitality uh, amongst the people and uh, a time of generosity and goodwill. Uh, it was a time for them to share blessings with other people, okay? So, so David sent well, approximately 10 of his men to talk with Nabal about his men's need for food and clothing. And as David saw it, Nabal wouldn't have had as many sheep to shear if it hadn't been for he and his men protecting them this whole time. But remember who we're dealing with. We're dealing with Nabal, and Nabal's the beast, okay? Let's go on in our text. Verse 9. When David's young men came, they spoke to Nabal according to all these words in David's name. Then they waited. But Nabal answered David's servants and said, Who is David and who is the son of Jesse? There are many servants today who are each breaking away from his master. Shall I then take my bread and my water and my meat that I have slaughtered for my shearers and give it to men whose origins I do not know? So Nabal approaches this request like an unrepentant Scrooge, Ebenezer Scrooge. He throws hospitality, he throws generosity out the window, okay? He lumped this would-be king with all of the desert bandits and outlaws out there who are always looking for a handout. He called David a no-account runaway slave, and he's got a bunch of nobodies around with him who aren't worth the ground that they're walking on. So Nabal has insulted David big time, okay? He's embarrassed him, he's humiliated him, he's disrespected him. Uh, this is worse than the soup Nazi on Seinfeld. No meat for you, no meat for you. 
Some of you got that reference. Others of you, I can see it went way over there. Oh, that's okay, because that's not a main and plain thing at all. So anyway, okay, back to our text. Verse 12. So David's young men retraced their way and went back. And they came and told him according to all these words. David said to his men, each of you gird on his sword. So each man girded on his sword, and David also girded on his sword. And about 400 men went up behind David, while 200 stayed with the baggage. All right, there's no doubt whatsoever of David's intentions here, right? Yeah, I mean, in the heat of the moment, in the heat of his anger, he's making a decision that has the potential to have lifelong consequences, right? And so here in the wilderness, we discover David with a real problem, all right? In 1 Samuel 24, David had experienced a tremendous victory in showing mercy and grace to King Saul. He's going to do it again in chapter 26 when he's got the opportunity to kill him again, but he shows him mercy. But sandwiched in between 24 and 25, or excuse me, 26, here is chapter 25, and uh, in 24 and 26, David's the restrainer, but here in 25... He is willing and able to do anything. He's bent on killing Nabal, and he's willing to do it because of his insults. It's almost as if Nabal's attitude and actions provoked something that was inside of David. And here we see a troubling inconsistency. David refused to harm the anointed king, but he's perfectly willing to murder an ordinary citizen. And we're seeing something here in David, perhaps for the first time, we're seeing that David's a dangerous man. David's to be feared. David actually has the potential to be a villain. And the people all around him at this point in his life, they know it. Because he's leading a group of guys that would make any biker gang look like a bunch of softies, okay? And so in this moment, we discover that David actually has a dark side. That he can show mercy and grace to someone in one moment, and in the next moment, light into them with all rage and anger. And honesty compels us to admit We probably do too. You see, loved ones, without the ruling influence of the Holy Spirit in our lives, there can be a duplicity about us that can show tenderness and patience to someone in one moment and in the next moment tear them apart. And you see, the line is usually crossed when it has something to do with a perceived assault on our egos or on our preconceived notions of importance. And when we're treated with disrespect or disdain or when we're embarrassed and humiliated, it's easy to kind of lash out, isn't it? And this is especially true if the person who's doing the disrespecting we find in our minds to be someone that we view as being lesser than us which is a big problem in and of itself. The speed with which we're able to respond without thinking can be frightening. And that's what happened to David. You see, his ego was bruised. He gave in to rage. And as he did, he lost all sense of his identity as the anointed of God. David was on the verge of becoming another Saul, out to get rid of anyone who threatened his status and role. Hmm. You know, it's amazing how easy it is to be a king or a queen in one instance and a beast in another. But fortunately for David, Nabal not only had an intelligent wife, but an observant servant. Take you to the text, verse 14. But one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, saying, Behold, David sent messengers from the wilderness to greet our master, and he scorned them. Yet the men were very good to us, and we were not insulted, nor did we miss anything as long as we went about them while we were in the fields. 
They were a wall to us, both by night and by day, all the time we were with them tending the sheep. Now, therefore, know and consider what you should do, for evil is plotted against our master and against all his household, and he is such a worthless man that no one can speak to him. The servant knows what David's capable of, and he knew he wouldn't be able to talk any sense into Nabal because, well, fools don't listen to advice. So instead, he goes to Abigail. And he told Abigail how Nabal had been his usual self with the servants of David, and he said that David's furious and he's on his way to settle the score. But then beauty intercedes. Beauty intercedes. And we can learn many things from her response, but I only want to focus on two today. You're welcome, just two. The first is this. We can learn of the power of God's restraining providence. We can learn of the power of God's restraining providence. See, as soon as Abigail heard what happened, she leaped into action. I mean, it's like she transforms into Paula Dean in a moment, and suddenly there's, you know, dinner for 600 on the back of a donkey. It's amazing. And given the hostility of David and, and the meanness of her husband, she's really putting herself on the line, isn't she? I mean, it's become clear to her, however, that she perhaps might be acting and speaking for God, though. And so she puts that ahead of her personal safety. And when Abigail reaches David's mob, she falls on her knees before David and she asks David for forgiveness and mercy. And if you'll allow me a little bit of a creative paraphrase of verses 24 through 26, Abigail basically says, I am sorry for all that's happened to you today. Nabal, my husband, is a worthless dude. He's true to his name, but don't stoop to his level, David. You see, David, one fool is enough in this story. David, don't forget who you are. David, do you remember how, how God was with you when you fought Goliath? David, do you remember all the ways that God has protected you from Saul? David, you're doing God's work, and, and David, he's fighting your battles. So, so, David, please, the moment that you take the battle out of God's hands, suddenly it's in your hands, and that's not what you want, right, David? You see, David was within a cat's whisker of tarnishing his future with a stain that could never be blotted out. But Abigail intervened, didn't she? Or perhaps we should say God intervened through Abigail. Notice what Abigail says to David, and this is uh, verse 26. Now, therefore, my Lord, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, since the Lord has restrained you from shedding blood and from avenging yourself by your own hand, now then let your enemies and those who seek evil against my Lord be as Nabal. Um, I recognize the word providence is kind of one of those big church words that sometimes leaves us scratching our heads. In many ways, God's providential care is, it reveals his prevenient grace, which is another church word that basically means his grace that goes before us. His grace that goes before us, that provides us the opportunity to respond to God's initiative taking in our lives, okay? And see, I believe this encounter between the beauty and the would-be king helps us to see that God's providential care is oftentimes experienced through the unworking, uh, unworking of his hand in our lives. You see, in his goodness and grace, God will offer much-needed guardrails for our lives. And sometimes he actually stops us from making a complete mess of our lives. Maybe you're like me, and, and you can look back on past events in your life where there were certain occasions when you just felt like, man, I've got a roadblock in my way. Man, Lord, I'm frustrated because I, I don't feel like you're answering my prayers. And, and, and now, as you look back, you can see what they truly were. They were actually miracles of mercy, because sometimes the things that we think are hindrances to our plans actually turn out to be the safety net of God's grace. 
One of the things that I've come to understand is that more times than not, in my life and in the life of others, sin is committed with a very short view of life in mind. It, we respond to the emotion, we respond to the feelings in the moment, or we respond to our desire for instant gratification, but rarely do we consider the long-term impact or consequences of our actions. You see, people don't oftentimes consider the full repercussions of what they do, especially in the heat of the moment. And they follow in the tragic footsteps of Nabal when they do so. You see, Abigail's words here are actually uh, God's restraining providence at work in David's life. It's helping him to see that his present desire for revenge is going to put his future at risk. Abigail's grace-filled words help David to see the long-term advantages of a clear conscience and that it far outweighs any momentary gains of yielding to the heat of the moment. Loved ones, God will not force us to respond to his providential actions in our lives. We still have a choice to make when God, by his grace, goes before us and he acts and he intervenes in our lives. But our decision to respond to God doesn't change the fact that God faithfully comes to you and me in and by his grace. And friends, I think we need to say thank you to the Lord for that. What do you think? Okay, I'm the only one. That's okay, I'll keep going. But we do, friends. So that's one thing we can learn from Abigail. The second thing that I think we can learn is beauty points us back to God. Beauty points us back to God. Uh, did you know there's actually a long-held tradition in the Christian church of recognizing beauty as a witness to God? You see, in the presence of beauty, especially when it's contrasted with all of the ugliness that we oftentimes find in the world, it, it allows us to have this small taste of the beauty of the Lord. And we see the beauty of the Lord in creation. We see it in art and music. We see it in architecture. We see it in so many different areas. And, and the thing about it, though, is I am fully convinced that the source of beauty that truly points us back to God is actually found in another human life that is displaying the beauty of the Lord shining through. And, and preachers and teachers of days gone by, they... They used to call the life of somebody who was doing that, they, they called it the beauty of holiness in their lives. Have you had that same experience with someone in your life? Perhaps you've had a similar experience as I have. You know, someone offends us or, or we don't get what we feel like we deserve and then our preoccupation with self-importance flares up and we're off to do something about it, usually something stupid, armed with self-righteous anger, right? And, and so we set off to defend our honor or avenge our hurt feelings and we put our self-image back into proper order and, and then we begin to say, well, I'm going to get even or I'm going to get it back and and then suddenly you're stopped in your tracks by something beautiful like the laughter of a child the objective perspective of an understanding friend maybe even the heavenly melody of a songbird singing out your window the majesty of a magenta sunset or sunrise all of those and more are heaven-sent Abigails. See, God beautifully shines into our circumstances, and, and when he does, we find ourselves confronted with something quite other than what we were feeling and getting ready to do. And in those moments, we suddenly remember who we are in Christ as someone quite different than what we were feeling and planning on doing. See, loved ones, that's God's restraining providence. That is the beauty of holiness. And it's what we see happening in our text. If you go to uh, verse 32, then David said to Abigail, 
Blessed be the Lord God of Israel who sent you this day to meet me, and blessed be your discernment, and blessed be you who have kept me this day from bloodshed and from avenging myself by my own hand. Nevertheless, as the Lord God of Israel lives, who has restrained me from harming you, unless you had come quickly to meet me, surely there would not have been left to Nabal until the morning light as much as one male. So David received from her hand what she had brought him and said to her, Go up to your house in peace. See, I have listened to you and granted your request. See, up to this moment, David was full of himself, wasn't he? But through the beauty of holiness in Abigail, in her attitudes, in her actions, God helped David rediscover his true sense of identity and purpose. And see, it makes me wonder, is the beauty of holiness present in our lives in such a way that our attitudes and actions do that for others around us? You see, loved ones, the beauty of holiness in our lives, it can actually be a conduit of God's life-transforming grace and the lives of people all around us. Your heavenly Father desires to partner with you to bring his salvation and his sanctifying grace into the lives of other people. Came across the story of two men who grew up best friends, though one was a little bit older. Uh, the two guys were uh, Philip and uh, Jim, and they, they did everything together. They, they bummed around together, they played together, they went to high school together, went to college together. After college, uh, they actually enlisted in the army together, and Jim and Philip were both sent to Germany together during World War II, and they fought side by side. And during one particular really fierce battle, uh, they were called to retreat, and as the men were running back, Jim noticed that Philip wasn't with him. And panic, as you can imagine, gripped his heart because he didn't know where his friend was. And, and Jim went and he, he begged his commanding officer for permission to, to go after his friend. And his, his CO said, are you stupid? That's suicide. But Jim disobeyed the order and he ran back into the gunfire, calling out Philip's name. And a short time later, he came back into uh, the encampment holding a limp body. And Jim's CO reprimanded him and said, see, it was a fool's errand. There was nothing you could do. To which Jim replied, you're wrong, sir. You see, I got there just in time, and before he died, he said, I knew you'd come. I knew you'd come. Following in the footsteps of Abigail can be risky, but I'm telling you, in God's faithfulness and grace, somebody ran through the fire and stood in the gap for all of us. His name is Jesus Christ. Are we willing to follow in the footsteps of Abigail and of Jesus and to be used of God in the lives of others? Uh, our story ends in a very surprising way. And if you turn your attention to verse uh, 36, we find this. Then Abigail came to Nabal, and behold, he was holding a feast in his house like the feast of a king. And Nabal's heart was merry within him, for he was very drunk, so she did not tell him anything at all until the morning light. But in the morning when the wine had gone out of Nabal, his wife told him these things, and his heart died within him so that he became as a stone. About 10 days later, the Lord struck Nabal and he died. The beast meant a very tragic and unfortunate end, which reminds us of Psalm 14.1, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. But here we find God struck the heart of the fool. Loved ones, the next time you're tempted by a fool, I want to encourage you to look for God's beauty in the world around you. Don't be surprised if God's providential care turns out to be someone whose life demonstrates the beauty of holiness in your midst. I'm uh, going to wrap this up. 
I just want to ask us, um, do you need to confess anything today? Has, has your life been more like the beast, uh, a fool who lives as if there's no God? Uh, do you need to confess that you've been demonstrating attitudes like the would-be king, full of yourself and acting out of a spirit of anger and vengeance? Do you need to commit your life fully to God? Do you need to offer a full consecration of your life to God, to his ruling presence and influence of the Holy Spirit so the beauty of holiness can be produced within you? You know, we develop the beauty of holiness in our lives through a lifestyle of discipleship. Is that something you need to commit to? or recommit to?